thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're just going to dive right in. So first question I have is, um, how did you come to play the flute? Well, I started in school band, like so many of us. And I think it was in grade four in that particular school district at the time when I was, my class was trotted into the gym and the band played for us. And they said, what instruments are you interested in? And I was interested in the flute and I was also fascinated by the, the glockenspiel. They had this big um, glockenspiel instrument. Mm -hmm. So obviously I was attracted to high sounds, to maybe to the color silver, who knows? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, the glockenspiel was extremely heavy, and I lived a fair distance from the school, and I walked to school every morning, so the flute won because it was smaller and lighter. <laughs> fair. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. So how long had you um, played, so you had your um, band mm -hmm. um, at, in grade four? Yeah, that was in Nanaimo, BC. Oh, Vancouver. brilliant. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So they started the, yeah, we got introduced to the instruments in grade four, and then we got to start band in grade five. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. So since then, you've been playing flute. Yeah. Great. That's amazing. I won't say I've been playing flute well for all that time. <laughs> you know what it's like when you first started? <laughs> <laughs> you will. You will. You will be playing it well, I'm sure. Um, what is your what is your um, flute journey? Because you, you played in band, which is the silver flute, and now you play the Baroque flute. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I didn't oh, switch. Um, mm -hmm. I play everything right now. But when I, um, so I, I started to take my music fairly seriously and played in youth orchestras and things and did the typical trajectory of a flute player and went to university. And in the middle of my undergraduate degree, um, Barthold Koeken came to town and I was introduced to the Baroque flute by one of the best Baroque flute players in the world. And I just fell in love with the sound. I, it was, it was the flute, but it wasn't the flute, you know, it was a completely mm -hmm. different voice. Haunting. It's yeah, really, um, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's hard to use words to describe sound, which mm -hmm. is probably why we all play instruments now. <laughs> sure. Yes, so we can express. Um, but I fell in love with the sound and my prof at uh, UBC also played Baroque flute. So when I showed an interest, I was allowed to take it as a secondary instrument. And then I um, participated in the Vancouver Society for Early Music summer workshops. And I got to study with Wilbert Hasselzett who um, was at that time playing with Musica Antiqua Kuhn in the Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra. Um, and I had a couple of summer programs where I got to study with him for a couple of weeks. And uh, Goodness. I, yeah, so I was completely, you know, in love with the Baroque flute, but I'm also in love with the silver flute. Like they're completely different, two vo they're two voices. And uh, yeah, so, um, and so now I play both. And I, oh, I also took up the recorder, sort right. of backwards. You know, a lot of people play recorder as kid and, and then s start right. playing the flute. But because I was doing early music when I was very into the Baroque and the Baroque flute and all of that, and then I was more, in, was getting interested in Renaissance music and I figured the recorder was actually a better voice and a more authentic voice for some of that material. So mm -hmm. I started um, playing recorder as well. Um, and, uh, and then through the recorder, I found myself in a position where I was able to teach, but teach utilizing all of my early music loves and skills that I had developed Brilliant. by by teaching um, recorder. So now I teach recorder and I teach flute and I play recorder and I play flute and I play silver flute and I play the wooden baroque flute and I play the recorder and I have this choice of voices that span centuries. What do you like about the Renaissance um, sound and time period? Um, well, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the fact that it's not a dividing line, but the line between classical and folk music, whenever I can sort of play in that gray area, I'm a very happy person. And especially in the Renaissance, um, when I'm doing things like the Van Eyck divisions on popular songs of the day, mm -hmm. I'm very much in that place mm -hmm. where I'm playing like classical art music, but it has a very strong sort of popular, popular music of the period um, sort of sense. core material. Yeah. And, but, you know, even in the, even in the Baroque, um, there's so much, well, um, Ensemble Caprice 
did a marvelous couple of albums where they really mined the gypsy influence in the music of Telemann and Vivaldi. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a lot of crossover between Eastern European folk music and art music of Central Europe. So there is this place where when you go into earlier and earlier music, the dividing line between this is classical music and this is folk music gets blurred. Okay. And I, then that's my happy place. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then that line gets uh, more um, closer to the surface when you get back into the Renaissance. Okay, so it's a crossover and it's the, the mix or the blend of two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Um, so it's a very peaceful period and it's very kind of calming um, mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But I sh but I should also say I play a fair bit of contemporary music on the recorder. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, and there's a lot of 20th century composers who are getting really interested in writing 20th century music for period instruments. So there's that whole end of it too, which is really interesting. Because you can use the the untempered scale. You know, if you're um, using a um, a mean tone or a Pythagorean tuning or a quarter comma mean tone or one of these untempered um, tuning systems and you have alternate fingerings so that you know F sharp and G flat actually do sound different from each other hmm. and, and then you and you've got a composer who's really interested in quarter tones this is a, a nice place to investigate artistically is that ever cool yeah yeah um, Rudolf Komaros wrote a piece for solo baroque flute called the necklace of clear understanding where he really plays with that sort of the the untempered semitone tunings. That's mm. really neat. Nice, nice. So, so there are all these voices, and the voices originate in different time periods, but they're not exclusive to those time periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've done beatboxing on the Baroque flute, too. You have? How did you, <laughs> how did you start that? Where did you come up with that? That's... Well, I, I, was, I was quite fascinated. You know, Greg Patillo and uh, all those guys who do all this amazing beatboxing on the flute. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a concert um, where we were sort of um, channeling Ensemble Caprice and doing some Eastern European gypsy music and crossing over between that and some Telemann. And we were looking for some percussion instruments that we could play, and I couldn't play the percussion instrument and hold my flute at the same time. So I thought, oh, well, what if I just do this sort of <laughs> into the Vero flute, and it worked. <laughs> nice. Never say no to a weird idea until, until you've tried it. <laughs> Well done. Good for you. <laughs> That's fun. Awesome. Awesome. So you were saying as well, just to kind of go back a little bit, that you did an undergrad degree. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I did my undergraduate um, degree at University of BC. Okay. Many, I was going to say back in the Jurassic period. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a long time ago now. Okay. Yeah. And it was for music and specializing in flute or? Um, it was a music degree where I specialized in um, flute, music history, and performance practice on period instruments. Okay. That's really a wide kind of range of... Yeah. A wide scope. Yeah. yeah. But they had a nice sort of general music degree program where you could sort of pick and choose your specialties. Okay. So rather than doing the, you know, the straight line, I'm going to become an orchestral player, I'm going to do auditions, I'm going to do this, I was being very broad. You spread out. I, yeah, I really did. Okay, okay. And does that help with teaching, knowing a variety of instruments? Do your students want to um, delve into variety? Or do you have students that just want to play silver flute? Or how does that Well, work? with with young students, you really have to just start on an instrument and get a certain level of facility and understanding on one instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I discourage students who play a little bit and then say, oh, it's getting hard. Maybe if I switch to this instrument, it's going to be easier now. And the answer to that is no. <laughs> you know, yeah. you'll just be a perennial beginner and you'll learn many instruments um, mm -hmm. at a very junior sort of elementary level, but you will never really get into something where you can sort of push your abilities. So, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. so I don't encourage my students to switch instruments a lot, but once they do um, get to a high level of ability and they see that I have other students playing other instruments and they see me in concerts doing different things, they might sh say, hey, you know, I'd really like to also learn to play this other instrument. And we will combine them in the lessons, but I won't let them quit one for the other. You've got too much invested in that right now. <laughs> that's a challenge, yeah, but that's the smart way to go. <laughs> Yeah. 
Good, good. Um, can you tell um, us about the performances that you do? Um, you do performances, solo performances, is that right? Um, I perform as a soloist. I perform with my husband, Thomas, as the Shane duo. Um, we've done a lot of that over the years. Um, we did a lot of uh, touring through the Community Arts Council touring circuit um, in the Western provinces. Nice, um, okay. Not so much, well, not so much now, right? The last couple of years, <laughs> what with COVID and everything. Right. Um, and uh, so, but we're always, uh, um, you know, looking at sort of interesting and innovative ways of sort of presenting um, music. My love, my big love is chamber music. And mm. the, the idea that a lot of chamber music was played at home, you know, after dinner, people would just pull out the instruments they could play and play all this wonderful nice. stuff. Because of course we didn't have stereos and MP3 players and things like that in those days. So everybody just played. And it was much more part of our general lifestyle. It wasn't like this special extra thing over here on the side that you did. It was more integrated. That's the word I'm looking for. And so when we sort of create concert programs and things like that, we always sort of think back to that and see how how interactive and how integrated we can make the performance mm -hmm. and explore um, sort of perhaps slightly unusual or creative ways of presentation. I, I owe that, um, first started doing that kind of work after I finished my undergraduate degree, I went to Toronto and I was lucky enough to be in the first cohort of people who went through the musical performance and communication program at the University of Toronto. And that's where they were taking sort of young professionals who were just starting out and saying, okay, what can you do that is really interesting? What can you do that's really sort of community driven? And we did a lot of school concerts and we played for seniors homes and we did a lot of sort of experimental presentation things for, for different audiences. And so that's how I started right at the beginning, thinking that way. And I've only kept doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, please keep doing it. Because it's, it's a, like you said, it's, it's really getting the community Mm -hmm. back to that level of community yeah, yeah. Um, and of, of um, being together and playing together and um, not having it as such a, a, a extracurricular yeah that are, you know part of every day <laughs> yeah it's a lifestyle thing right yeah mm -hmm. okay um, I have another question um, do you have a mentor that has given you a really good piece of advice a really good tip to play with or mm. or many mentors <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what i was just going to say you know you can't just boil it down to just one it's a jolly well, question <laughs> <laughs> well um uh well wilbert hasselzett is my baroque flute mentor or role model mm -hmm. should i say just for his incredible playing and his really really deep commitment to the music and his, his, his incredible focus. Hmm. When he walked into the room and he was ready to play or teach or whatever, he was just there, he was there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and you were sort of brought into Ron his in, yeah. energy field, you no know, choice. and you okay. came out, you know, later going, <laughs> so, you know, uh, um, you know, with having had a really profound experience. So mm -hmm. the, the role modeling and the, the sort of energy feeling of having had the joy of working with him was sort of my Baroque flute. I can't really put that into words. I can't say he gave me one piece of advice. It was more mm -hmm. of a, a feeling. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes my, 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 my teaching mentor, I have to give credit to David Gary, who was um, uh, teaching at McMaster University for many years. And he was my main um, mentor through the Suzuki teacher training at the advanced levels. And so he was, again, a, a great role model in terms of um, really seeing the student in front of you and recognizing that all students were individual. And even though you have your curriculum and your course of studies and your plan for, we're gonna do step A before step B before step C, being able to um, 
recognize how the student in front of you might have different needs in terms of pacing or order in which you want to do things and really working with that that student as a person and not trying to fit them into your plan at all. Right. So, so he, he was more... brilliant. Yeah. Nice. Um, nice. And I am, uh, you know, and uh, I find my, I constantly quote him. You, know? <laughs> hmm. you have any off the top of your head? It depends. Mm -hmm. So yeah. He had a sign on his wall, mm -hmm. which he had framed, and it just said, it depends. Hmm. Dot, dot, dot. That's a really good answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the number of times, um, he was also great for giving out stickers. <laughs> um, you know, when he was, all the kids loved him, you know, he would give out stickers. He was just a really charismatic teacher. Mm -hmm. And I still treasure, I was at a conference once taking a course from him and I had a name tag. Mm -hmm. And I was taking this course from him. And every time we answered a question particularly well or brought up a really good question that was a good topic in the class. He'd give us a sticker and I had this little name tag covered with stickers and I still cherish it. <laughs> so do you have any for either Baroque flute, um, the silver flute um, or the recorder, any tips that you have for a player, for a new player or for an intermediate or advanced player? Uh, tips. Mm -hmm. Breath um, control or positioning or I don't know. Um, for a transverse flute, and this is, goes for both wooden flute and silver flute, I always come back to play harmonics. Really? Yeah. So what do play. you find they do? What's the best thing about that? Well, if you can play all the, the whole overtone series that you can on your instrument, and like on the silver flute, you can get quite an extended overtone series if you start in the low register. On Baroque flute, not so much. Um, mm -hmm because of just the way the instrument's built, but you can still do it um, in a limited way. But if you can play as much of the overtone series as you can on your instrument, then you can get the air to go where you want the note to be. And then mm -hmm. the fingers just are assist a little bit. Okay. But the flute sound, it's about the air. So, one of the things I keep telling my students is you're not playing the flute, you're not playing the recorder, you're playing the air. Hmm. And this is just an air manipulation device. So don't think about the machinery of the instrument, think about the vibrating tube of air that's inside really it. That's like what that. you're really playing. So you're playing the air, you're manipulating yeah. the movement and the speed of it, okay. And if you're playing the overtone series and playing harmonics, you're working with just a pure air with no fingers. Right. And you're learning all kinds of things about what to do about your embouchure huh. and the air speed and the air angle. Um, the the <laughs> um, my uh, I, I I got to meet Jean Pierre Rampal. You got to meet him. Yeah, after a concert, he was um, a friend He's of my. He's my teachers. personal favorite player. Like I love James Galway, but yeah, Pierre Jean Paul. Rampal sure. is elegant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, but. Um, he was a, a friend of my teachers, um, Paul Douglas at UBC. And after a concert that he did in Vancouver, um, we all went over to Paul's house and we were chatting and eating and drinking and playing our instruments. And uh, I actually got to play the Baroque flute for Jean-Pierre Rampal. He yeah. said absolutely nothing. He was very kind. <laughs> but he did make a comment after that when we were talking about instruments with keys and instruments without keys. And he said that, he would really like to have a silver flute where you didn't have so much key between your fingers in the air that you could actually get have more direct contact with the air mm. because he was um, sort of on that same wavelength about it's all about the air and what okay. you're doing to manipulate the air and he had a thought that uh, um, an instrument with uh, sort of larger tone holes perhaps he, he had no interest in even trying the Baroque flute. You know, we offered him one. And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. Um, but uh, he, did, he did say he would be interested in a silver flute that didn't have keys. And later, when I was investigating the history of the flute, I actually found, for a very brief time, that they did make silver flutes with ring keys. Hmm. Um, like on a clarinet. Cool. Okay. So, and, and then I immediately thought of what uh, Ron Paul had said about this. I thought, wow, you know, 
So there's an absolutely massive big hole and just a really thin silver hoop around it that, that um, works the connecting key. Um, fiendishly, interestingly, I won't say difficult, but strange mm -hmm. to play because the holes are so large. Okay. You know, uh, a small person with small fingertips would have difficulties mm -hmm. getting the hole covered. But I thought, oh, that's exactly what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. and later, when I was investigating the history of the flute, I actually found, for a very brief time, that they did make silver flutes with ring keys. Hmm. Um, like on a clarinet. Cool. Okay. So, And, and then I immediately thought of what uh, Ron Paul had said about this. I thought, wow, you know. So there's an absolutely massive big hole and just a really thin silver hoop around it that, that um, works the connecting key. Um, fiendishly, interestingly, I won't say difficult, but strange mm -hmm. to play because the holes are so large. Okay. You know, a small person with small fingertips would have difficulties mm -hmm. getting the hole covered. But I thought, oh, that's exactly what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Um... That's really cool. That's really good to know. Thanks. Anyway, that's, Thanks. <laughs> but that's a digression. Anyway, uh, harmonics, <laughs> overtones. Yes. Right, Play right. the air, not the flute. Okay. Or the flute at back if you're talking about the recorder. You're, you're still, it's all about the vibrating air column. Good. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Do you have any performance advice? Get out there and play. <laughs> advice. Experience. Well, Get out there and. Okay. I, I used to have debilitating stage fright. I used to shake okay. when I performed. Okay. Um, um, when I did my juries in my undergrad, you know, I was shaking so much the instrument was, it felt like it was blah, 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 <laughs> and I had, you know, and my knees were shaking and I was just a, a wreck. I had a really horrible time. Okay. Um, and so I got together with some friends and we created a group and hired ourselves out to play for weddings. And we played two or three weddings every weekend for a summer. And after that, nothing scared me anymore. Perfect smart. Well done. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. You know. That's really good advice too. You know, if you're if you're scared, if you are, you know, or wanted to get over something, then just go to it and do it, right? Yeah. yeah but uh, you know, um and so often we get hung up in this perfectionist thing mm -hmm. where we're not ready to play it yet. We're not ready to play it yet. We're not ready to play it yet. And we never take advantage of an opportunity to get out there and actually you know, play for people. And that's a, a downward spiral. <laughs> if you're, um, as they say in the, uh, um, in the startup community, just ship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a first iteration of your product, just ship. And there will be a second iteration that will be better. So then ship that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And we need to and I'm not saying that people should be running around going out there and playing unprepared performances. Um, don't don't misunderstand me. <laughs> um, but you know, there's a there's a point where you just have to get out there and play and learn from that before you can take your next step. Yeah, that makes so sense. So that's that's my advice: is just do it. Good. Um, our last question. Tell us something we don't know about you. That was the one I was having a hard time with. It is a challenging <laughs> question. <laughs> um, um, if you want to keep it uh, sort of flute related, um, a lot of people don't know that I travel, or at least before COVID happened, I was traveling regularly to Peru and Ecuador to teach. Um, at several festivals there. And there's a wonderful school in Ecuador called Inepe, um, which uh, provides a wonderful educational um, experience in Quito for um, kids who are part of a poorer community. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with those people a few times, and it was just really quite wonderful. We were talking earlier about involving the whole community in what you're doing. Yeah. And they were just so, they had created such a beautiful community around their school, it was, it was brilliant very inspiring so uh, so there's a flute related that? Thing. how did you think about um going to start that type of community and to 
um, be kind of the the uh, teacher for you know somewhere across across the the sea <laughs> going, <laughs> going all the way over there what what um sparked that it, as an interest well actually that started when i became a teacher trainer for the suzuki association of the americas and so i quite often get asked to travel places to offer teacher training courses you seem like a teacher trainer to me <laughs> yeah, i would have pegged you as that <laughs> um yeah well i'm interested in pedagogy you know as a process right. But um, yeah, so, you know, that's been uh, a really, really good experience and very gratifying because, you know, if you really want to make a, a difference mm -hmm. in the world, yes, um, if I can help one teacher yeah. and have better access to resources and materials and ideas and methods that will help them, that teacher will then go out and work with more students than I would ever be able to work with just as an individual. Exactly. And if this can also be bringing um, a higher quality of education to areas that may not have access to it, that's even better. Okay, you know what? Um, we're going to leave it there for now, Kathleen. I um, want to thank you so much on behalf of the EFA for your information and for uh, letting us pick your brain. Like I said, I'm always...